Hello, everyone. We are here with a St. Lotus recap of the Stealth VRD, the uh, St. Lotus Presents number three. We did as a friends and family draft, uh, and we're going to be chatting about kind of how the deck went, uh, how the draft went overall, um, and then specifically how Kevin's deck went. So how drafting mono red in this format goes, um, what kind of things you are excited about, what things, uh, what decisions you'd make differently next time. Um, as well as kind of like how you draft mono red in a field where I think a lot of people knowing knowing you knowing walking <laughs> into the deck that you're going to be in the red lane like there's not a lot of questions about that just knowing your persona and obviously like your clothes today your clothes <laughs> on the event like you knew what you were doing going in and everyone else knew to probably stay out of your lane so I mean I've always been a red mage mm -hmm. like old school affinity wasn't fast enough so I had lightning bolts <laughs> <laughs> type of thing reasonable <laughs> So, but. yeah, so I guess let's, let's kind of, let's recap this draft overall, because I think there's, like, mm. a lot of things that went kind of interestingly about it. Um, this is where we were. Uh, we had uh, we had Eric, myself, and then Cody, Dan, Sam, Steven, you, and Brandon. So mm -hmm. uh, just, like, give kind of the big players here. We knew day one Sam is going to be in some kind of black deck, probably a black-white deck. We, like, we knew you were going to be on some kind of, going to blue something. I mean, I don't even love blue, but yeah, I'll, I'll be in combo. For sure I'll be in combo, because I don't think you can play this format without playing a combo finisher, at least. Um, we figured Steve was going to be on some kind of um, two-card Monty pile, because that's what he tends to gravitate towards. Very likely <laughs> artifacts, probably Urza. Um, Brandon's going to be doing something shenanigans -y that's like not a lot of power, but has all these cards that work together beautifully. Um and yeah, C Cody probably can do any kind of blue deck. Dan's going to be in a blue deck. Mm -hmm. Eric is all over the map. Maybe he's going to combo out. Maybe he's going to play right. fair. Um, but yeah, the, the field was like pretty known, right? It wasn't like walking into a random table. This is one where day one, we all kind of knew what was happening. I mean, it's one of those things I like to think of myself because I'm also a bit of a brewer. So I like to think of myself as a bit of a wild card. But when I happen to fall into the Mox Ruby seat, I'm like, okay. Red, <laughs> yeah, because that that was my, that was what I hoped to do. Because I pretty much got the deck I was hoping for. Sure. So yeah, let's talk about kind of how the draft went, right? Like we had the only real like interesting thing here about this was that Dan took Time Vault, and I guess Brandon going with the double colorless uh, was also like not the most standard. But those were really the only two things that kind of fell out before we got back around to your wheel, right? You take Ruby, as you do, mm -hmm. um, but then you come back and take the Emerald there. So let's talk about, starting from there, kind of what your thoughts were on the draft. I mean, at the time, I was thinking Mox Emerald was just too much value to leave on the table. Fair. But at the same time, in hindsight, it's probably actually the pick I got the most wrong. <laughs> okay, so what, what should you have done instead of the Emerald there? Like, passing in a, a Mox is a pretty big deal. What do you take over it? Um... I mean, I wasn't expecting to be fighting anyone else for red, but uh, I was wrong, and Eric took Ragavan with his second pick, mm -hmm. so that actually made me had to reevaluate everything in order, because I figured, like, most of my main board cards, I'm not fighting anyone on, so got to, now I've got to have to go for all my sideboard stuff. Sure. Is Ragavan that important to the red deck, you think? In this particular format, I do... Because uh, it is, there's almost never a point in the game where it's not relevant. Sure. Because of the dash. That makes sense. It just kind of is, is a closer for the deck, or is it like a um, like I, I obviously turn one Ragavan is like often a game close game. Um, but you're saying that kind of in the later game when you just top deck the Ragavan, the dash. Yeah, yeah, because it, it's it's a haste creature. Sure. And a lot of times haste creatures mess up combat math. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess. What was your plan going in? Like, obviously, like if if you get the ruby seat, what what's your what's your like? I assume you have a page of notes, even if they're in your head, right? Like, <laughs> what is your uh, what's your ruby seat plan? So coming into this one, my plan was if I got the mox ruby seat to do kind of like uh, not quite burn, but still a mono red aggro. Okay. But have a bunch of sideboard pieces to be able to sideboard into. Uh, completely transformative into a uh, mono red a version of mono red prison. Okay. Because um, what I've seen in the past is the mono red decks or like the burn decks in this format, they just almost always fold to the 
combo decks and the more unfair decks. Okay, so you, you see them as kind of like they can close out against the big control, like big blue, mm. but struggle against kind of the fast, like uh, whatever, like grindstone decks or something. Right, and yeah. um, because it's not that burn isn't fast, it's just combo tends to be a little bit faster than burn because burn has a set amount of turns before it can kill you. Sure. Like, no burn deck is killing you on turn one. Right, of course. Yeah, that makes sense. But three to five, completely in the realm of possibility for burn. Sure. So the prison prison strategies have, in general, have had a hard time in VRD, right? We, we've seen way back in the days of uh, Shotgun Lotus that they tried kind of like, we're going to take Workshop and then take the Thorn and take uh, take um, a Trinisphere. And kind of those type of decks have had a really hard time, honestly. Like, they haven't, they haven't been very successful. Um, do you think that from the perspective of a red deck, it is good? Or is it that because you know that you're only going to have to play that deck in the games that you sideboard into it, that it's good? Or, like, why is it uh, why is it justified in kind of a red deck's perspective? So what I was thinking is uh, by having the prison package in the sideboard, it's going to give you more, just more options against the unfair decks. And at the same time, a lot of times you'll still have a few burn spells to be able to close out the game through your various prison pieces. Okay. Whereas a lot... A lot of other prison decks in this format, they they may be able to slow things down, but they don't necessarily have a, closer. a, a way to win through yeah. everything. That makes sense. And that was kind of my logic coming in. Sure. Yeah, that tracks. So maybe let's jump over to actually take a look at your deck and see kind of like where it ended up. Um, obviously, like we're going to walk through the, the draft as well and see kind of like what picks happened when, but um, seeing that kind of where your deck ended up. Uh, what did you think about kind of where it closed out? Uh, what cards really stood out to you? Oh, uh, because you, you have like you have lots of things here, right? You you got Kamano faces Kazakhan, Kazakhstan yeah. was a pretty new one, uh, um, but you did play some main deck prison pieces like Blood Moon. Well, uh, part of, that was part of my plan going into because in the entirety of the draft, I took exactly one non basic land. Oh wow! Okay. Because I knew I instead of drafting lands. It, because a lot of people draft too many mainboard cards, not enough sideboard cards. I needed the ability to go fully transformative, so I needed all the sideboard slots I could get. So I took exactly one non-basic land, and that was Valakut. Sure. Like, could I have taken a fetch? Sure. Yeah. Did I need to? Not really. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I know a lot of people, when they draft Mono Red, they uh, start the run on lands early, right? That's kind of the power of that seat, is that there's not a lot of contested cards, so you can... Uh, you can start the fight over things like Scalding mm -hmm. Tarn pretty early. Uh, in this draft, Eric actually did that anyway for you. He took fourth mm -hmm. round Scalding Tarn, which is mm -hmm. like, incredibly unusual, but uh, is, is I, seemed like pretty good in this case. I right? think part of it is also, I don't think Eric was expecting me to just completely not care about the land run. Right, I assume that, yeah, he did, did that because he assumed you were going to be joining him. And, did like I said, m my plan going in was... I'm, if I get the ruby seat, I'm going to take Valakut, and I don't care about fetches. Sure. And because you have the Magus and the right. Man. Okay. So. How did those function for you over the draft? Like, we'll talk about your record and stuff later. But like, did, did those cards stand out? I know in general, I'm pretty suspect of uh, the moon effects, given that this is a format where you end up with a lot of non basics, but you also end up with a lot of basics in every deck. I mean, yeah, they're not they're not as good. It. In this format, as say, modern. legacy or vintage or yeah. modern, but they're still not awful. Sure, because most of the lands people you, most of the non-basics in this format, are fixing. Right, and if I can just take you off of your fixing, sure, that that's huge, because like that alone can steal a game or two throughout the course of a day. That makes sense. And uh, and then Magus, he's just a also a body in a pinch. Right. Yeah, Magus seems like. Uh, honestly, Magus in this format seems stronger than uh, than the Blood Moon itself. I, I'd say it's 50-50. Sure. Because the, while the Magus has the body, which is very relevant, there's also more spot removal for creatures in the format than there is for enchantments. Gotcha. That makes sense. I just realized that our uh, our view of the cards is off here. Sorry about that. Let's fix this in a minute. Do, 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 do. Hi. Slide over. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, with the um, there we go. We're back. Um, with the 
were there any cards that really stood out as kind of this was something that was either way above board or way below board that you expected? Like when after playing the matches? Um, wish. Wish it was uh, good or bad. Um, I think like I played it because um, one of the advantages of having the transformative plan is I also had a lot of silver bullets in my sideboard. Yep. And I figured that might help me get to some of my silver bullets. But most of the time, I just found it being too slow. Yeah, three mana is a lot to tack onto another spell. That, and I misremembered Wish. I thought it was put it in your hand, not you have to play it this turn. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, every other Wish is that way. So that, that's definitely different. But but yeah, so I'd say Wish was easily the weakest card. Okay. I think I actually boarded it out every round. Yeah. But uh, it's, like I said, part of that was I didn't quite remember exactly what it did. And part of it was just... I thought it would do a thing, and it just wasn't quite good enough at the thing. That makes sense. Anything else that, like, uh, you played a lot of new cards, right? You played Solfim, you played Torolf, Torbrand. These are all cards I have no idea what they do. (laughs) So, um, Solfim is actually from the new set, and uh, he he doubles all of your non-combat damage. All right, I, I I can't find this card, so. And he's also a four mana, five, four. So he's just an efficient beater. Sure. Uh, Torolf, again, another 4-mana 5-4 that essentially gives all of your non-combat damage trample. Torbrand, you're saying? Or, no, Torolf. Torolf. Weird. All right, something weird is going on here, but that's fine. (laughs) And then... um, Tor Brand adds extra damage to all your red sources. Sure. Uh, yeah, he's a 2-4 four for 4, but essentially he's a 4-4 four four because of right. his own ability. That makes sense. Uh, so did, did any of the... I mean, these are all like decently expensive cards, right? Costing 4 is not nothing in this format? It, it's not, but at the same time with two Moxes, uh, sure. Simeon Spirit Guide, like it, it wasn't out of the realm of possibility to get them in play on turn 1. Wild. Okay, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. It wasn't likely. Yeah. But it was... Po- and like, there were several times where I would get him out a turn or early with a spirit guide or a mox. Right. And turn three seems very likely, right? Like that Yeah, and, and they have effects that immediately are impactful. Sure. And then you also ran a bunch of instants, right? Like, running all these mm-hmm. kind of hate, all the, like, burn cards. Mm-hmm. Some of them didn't point at faces, like, a braid, but obviously it's still, like, a strong card. Impact Resonance, similarly. Um, any of these, any of these like, feel like they are must-plays for future burn players or things that uh, maybe you should avoid for next time? Um, Impact Resonance was okay at best, but it the main reason it, it made the cut was because it was the best answer I had to big things. Okay. Because of the way it's worded, it can just be any source. It doesn't even have to be one I control okay. that deals the dam- damage that I'm ch- basing X off of. Yeah. So. Uh, or, like, even I make a big swing, I can also use it to wipe a, a bunch of little guys off the table. Because okay. it does divide the damage as you choose. Sure. So... It got played mostly for its um, flexibility and, and ability to deal with bigger threats that are outside the range of normal burn spells. Got it. Did it, did it ever like have any big plays for you? No, but I also think I only drew it exactly once on the day. Okay, fair, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it killed a creature. It did what it was supposed to do. Sure, that's good. Okay, cool. So let's uh, let's talk about kind of like how you felt like the draft went. So if we kind of like compare uh, your, your picks and as far as like how things went throughout the day, you mentioned that kind of you didn't anticipate a lot of things contested and obviously like signaling that with taking a seventh round uh, red elemental blast is definitely like in that same thought mm-hmm. process, right? Like if no one else can be taking your exquisite firecraft, so you can, you can move the other mm-hmm. things up the priority list. Yeah, well, the only reason I even took red elemental blast there was, um, the time back through, Eric had taken Pyroblast. Sure. And it's like, I know I need at least one of them. That makes sense. I don't necessarily need both, but I need at least one of them. Were there any others of these picks that kind of like jumped up the list for you based on kind of what happened during the draft? Um, 
Lightning Bolt actually jumped up quite a bit when um, Eric took Ragavan. Sure. Because it was a burn spell that there's no red deck that doesn't want to play it. Sure. And not like not having it would just feel wrong. Okay. Fair. <laughs> but uh, what about the breach? That the breach, I will say, uh, did hurt my plans later on in the draft. Not that that's anything personal or anything like that, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, why did you take Breach? Because that, that's a card that wouldn't normally fall into kind of a traditional burn-heavy red deck or even a creature-heavy red deck. So the, part of that has to do with my experience with the card mm -hmm. because it, for the longest time I've been playing Mono Red Prowess in Modern. Sure. And I actually have Underworld Breach in the list. And I've had a game where I've cast the same copy of Lightning Bolt four times in one turn. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it, it triggers Prowess when it comes into play a lot. Right. And it... Well, anything else. it it's just a under the radar way that I've seen that gives burn decks just extra reach. Sure. That a lot of people don't see coming. That's fair. And yeah, you did play some prowess creatures, right? Like Soul Scarvage as well mm -hmm. as um, uh, what's the other one? The the two mana version, right? Or did I miss no. that? Okay, I, th I thought you Soul, played the two mana. Soul Scar Mage was the only prowess creature I had, but it was picked more for how it interacts with the burn spells and mm -hmm. making things permanently smaller sure then the like yeah it would i probably at some point should have taken swift spear sure but at the same time i the deck was crafted in such a way it, it didn't feel necessary it would have been nice but wasn't necessary sure um what about other other kind of plays you made here that it seems like the, the cards that jump out to me are things like ensnaring bridge seems like it's grabbing from the Karn player uh, mm -hmm. The Shadow Spear, grabbing it from the Urza Saga player. Uh, is, is that kind of where your head was at with those? Or, or why? what other cards kind of jumped jumps, uh, um, around in your list? In Staring Bridge was definitely one of them. Because I know that that, and Torpor Orb a little later on too, mm -hmm. was one of the ones that jumped higher. But in Staring Bridge especially, because it's a very key piece to the prison strategy. Okay. Like, Realistically, if you don't have the ensnaring bridge, you don't have the prison strategy available to you. Okay, yeah, that makes especially sense. from from a mono red perspective. Sure. Um, this Sardian Cliff Stomper seemed like it was a very it seemed really strong to me. I mean, it, it killed me, right? But I don't know if it, 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 how did it fare throughout the rest of the day. Oh, uh, you you were actually the only time it hit the table. Okay, fair enough. But um, it was for when the games go long, just a cheap beater. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> And that's what it is. <laughs> so, obviously, like, during this draft, I think your deck didn't perform at the level that it should have, right? And, like, yeah. For, for whatever reason. It, but... it was bad variance. It yeah. happens. <laughs> sure. Uh, do, do you think that there's anything that you would change? Like, would you still do the prison transformative sideboard plan? Is Absolutely. That... Okay. You think that's the way to go? Like, and I think the list I drafted is, at most, five cards off of what I would consider optimal. Okay. And the main ones that I didn't get that I wanted were Ragvan and then later on Fury. Fury, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because when did Fury go? Was that was that one that you felt like you were purposely floating and got sniped from you? Or was that one that just kind of it, fell off your radar? It, it didn't fall off my radar. It got taken right about when I was planning on taking it. Okay. So I wouldn't necessarily call it a snipe because it's about where Eric probably wanted to be taking it too. Sure. He, it just, he pulled the trigger on it before I did. That makes sense. Um, th there's a lot of cards that are kind of like sideboard cards that feel like they could be main board cards in your list, right? And that's not to say that it's wrong, right? But um, whenever I see that, I think that's a thing, especially like people that uh, haven't put as much thought as you and I put into this format. It's a common mistake where they'll mm. take a lot of cards that uh, that they're just like, oh, this card would be good, this card would be good, and they end up with like 40 playables in their in their pool. Um, do, do you think that there are red silver bullets that missed out on this list? Or was it just kind of like, these are the best cards and some of them are better for different matchups? Like, um, I, th I think there were some red silver bullets that, um, depending on how, what everyone else was drafting, I would have looked into harder. But I didn't take because I didn't feel like I necessarily needed them. Like one of them, I forget what it is, but uh, there's a, it's a, like a three mana three two with protection from red. Oh, okay. I just didn't see that being relevant in this field. <laughs> sure, yeah. Something like Flash Fires, right? There, there's not like a right. mono-white player in this field. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I I could have maybe taken Boyle and hurt, hurt a few people, but 
again, uh, I think you were the only one that would have been absolutely devastated by Boyle. Yeah, I mean, we did have five blue drafters, but again, right, everyone's in multiple colors. Right. It's not like there's anybody heavily in. Like, pretty rare that somebody drafts high tide, like me. And, it, like, the, those particular hate cards in this draft, not worth it. In other drafts where you have more people in, like, those close to those monocolor decks, yeah, I, w- I would consider them. But this time around, I just didn't feel that they were needed. Sure. So, I mean... What do you what do you think this deck should have ended up? Right, obviously it ended up one seven, like bad variance that happens. But like, what do you think the like, if you had the same the same pile of exactly forty six cards uh, and played it a hundred thousand times, what do you think is kind of like where is the average place this deck falls? I mean, on a good day, it probably uh, is five two six one, but average probably four three three four. Okay, which. Not not bad, but it, it's one of those decks. It, it has the potential on any given day to do really well. Right. We're, like it's one of those. I f- I feel it has a lower. F- it d- might not have as high of a ceiling as some decks, mm-hmm. but I also think it has a higher floor than than a lot of decks that are popular in this format. That makes it's, sense. Because yeah, you, you're, if your deck fails to function, right, you're still casting lightning bolts. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, what do you think on kind of the like the the heavy creature decks that are playing lots of uh, lots of aggressive creatures uh, like whatever the robber of the rich and things like that? Uh, and then there's some decks that kind of like the one Chad drafted. I we actually pulled that one up. I think it was in one of the Saint Lotus Presents. Yeah, Let's it was see. the one I wasn't at because I yeah. actually worked with him going into the event and help, helped. I'm like, here's some cards to look for and stuff like that because he's like he reached out to me. He's like, hey, I want to play red. What would you suggest I do? Right, and Chad ended up going six one with that deck, which obviously like he played a lot more of the the aggressive uh, burn spells, and then also some Chandras. Mm-hmm. Do you think like do you think that that kind of heavier spell deck is better? Do you think the like really heavy creature deck playing mostly just like aggressive goblin guides and things like that is better, or do you think it's kind of this middle ground where you have a little bit of both and then have the prison's alternate switch? I think it depends on what the other seven drafters at the table are doing. Okay. Like, Mono Red is kind of, in this format, it's kind of interesting because there's several different routes you can go, Mm -hmm. and which one is correct is based on what everyone else is doing. A lot more than any of, like, the common combo decks you see in the format. That makes sense. When do you have to make that call? Is that, like, on pick four you need to decide which direction you go, or, like, how long can you float that decision? Um, it... Realistically... Pro- you probably have until like pick six or so to make the decision. Sure. And you, in those first rounds, you can just take generically good stuff. Like I went Mox Mox, Lightning Bolt, mm-hmm. just generically good stuff. But uh, no, I think you probably have five, six rounds before you. And that also gives you enough time to figure out which route to go based sure. on what everyone else is doing. Yeah, are there any, like, signpost standouts of, like, this is the, if I see this, then I should go to X, Y direction? Or it's, like, if you if you can tell everybody's going to be in fair decks, which direction do you go? Like, a, kind of, for future red drafters, wh- wh- what are the kind of things that you'd look for? So, um, I think uh, a version like what I had with the creatures in the burn spells or a more burn spell heavy package yeah. is good for the field full of more fair decks. Okay. And... Uh, Whereas the more the ability to switch into the prison style deck with a few just burn spells to close things out Mm -hmm. is better for like the more combo heavy days. That makes sense. I mean, given that you just like shut me down (laughs) two zero very quickly. I mean, that worked out really well. Game two, you even got chill in play, and I'm like, don't care. (laughs) Didn't matter. Yeah, it was too late. It was too slow being on turn two. Um, so two two kind of like things that you didn't do that I think are pretty standard uh, just like uh, thoughts on them one is Remy Nap Ruins uh, is, is that just that you have the moons and you don't want to uh, you don't want to like diversify or what, why why did you decide away from this card because obviously like Chad drafted it it's something that you, you are aware of uh, it's one of those cards it was one of those like or I, Barbarian Ring same, I, same deal right? yeah I, I could have I just Again, was trying to maximize my sideboard slots okay. with the transformative. 
And the more non-basic lanes you take, the fewer slots you have for that. Totally, right, yeah. That's. It, I feel like the, the benefit of these cards is you don't have to think of sideboard cards. <laughs> Whereas I had the exact opposite plan of, yeah. I want as many sideboard cards as, as possible for the transformative. Mm -hmm. Because I think the transformative board plan is incredibly underutilized in this format. Interesting. Like, I think there are more decks than just mono red that can do it. Sure. You just have to have someone willing to try. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a lot of the question of sideboard cards are so powerful in this format that it's hard to justify a truly transformative deck rather than just bringing in solar bullets. Mm -hmm. Um. So other other thoughts, Chandra. Chandras are pretty good. Uh, even, even if you just kind of like look at the the newer Chandras, right? Mm -hmm. Like Dress to Kill, for instance, is one that has been played a few times, uh, if it ever pulls up. Um, the only reason I shied away from the from Chandra's because uh, you've got uh, Dress to Kill and Torch of Defiance. They're, they're both very, very good cards. And uh, the only reason I shied away from him is I already had the three creatures main board at four mana. Oh, sure. That makes sense. Yeah. So it, it was more about curve than anything else okay. on him. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you do have you do have a pretty high end curve. Like you're not running things like Hell Hellblazer. What's what's the card? Hell Hellrider. You're not running Hellrider, right? Which is kind of like a traditional top out or Koth. That's just another traditional top out card. You kind of chose these big creatures instead. Well, like I said earlier, I I chose them because they have immediate effects on the board, even if they're not involved in combat. Sure. And those eff effects are to the tune of getting extra damage, that makes some sense. way, shape, or form. So it. I was also trying to, in like the list of burn spells I picked for the most part, outside of Lightning Bolt, they all act. Uh, so, Lightning Bolt and Lightning Strike were the only ones that didn't have added flexibility built in. Sure. Like, had a couple that made it so damage couldn't be prevented or. You had scries. Right. Yeah. Just little extra effects to help. And, like, Fire Blast has the added advantage of I don't need mana to play it. Right, that makes yeah. Fire, I, I think it would be criminal to not play Fire Blast. I think it feels like the best burn card in this format. Um, last individual card I wanted to talk about: uh, Price of Progress. It's the it's the my personal pick for what card should be inducted into modern immediately. Um, but wh why didn't this one make your cut? Uh, again, it it's one of those things. It could have just been in in the heat heat of drafting. I just straight up didn't think about it. Sure. Uh, which I think was part of it, and part of it was also, I'm already on the main main board Blood Moon Megas of the Moon plan, yeah, which makes Price of Progress just infinitely worse. Yeah, that's fair. I guess they don't, <laughs> they're not going to play their non basics at that point. Right. So it's like I can play one okay card that is made infinitely worse by two cards I made main boarding. That makes sense. Or I can just pick something else. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Fair. Cool. Um, any uh, any like closing thoughts? Things that you would change? Things that you'd like instruct other drafters to do differently, or uh, or like uh, things you want to like signpost for future red drafters? Oh, like I, said, I think the biggest takeaway from this particular deck was I think people more people need to explore a transformative board. Sure. Because e even though I had bad variants on the day, I still think. Like we said earlier, I run this same list back. I'm probably middle of the pack at worst on yeah. average. No, that makes sense. Yeah, you had some like pretty heartbreaking scenes. Yeah, no, I, I pretty much, my deck pretty much only performed against you and Steven. Well, I'm always really happy to hear that, yeah. But no, like, I got mana flooded to the point. I was actually a, against Eric. I had a game where I was able to get out of a Karn Lattice Lock through Valakut. That's pretty sweet. But the fact that the game was going on long enough for me to do that is yeah. still impressive. Totally, right. Without me being dead. <laughs> so I guess, what other transformative decks do you see, right? Obviously, like, sideboarding into kind of, like, a hyper-controlling prison-style deck is one. Um, but what other kind of, like, like the obvious one that you've done before, actually, is the uh, sideboarding to Relentless Rats, <laughs> which sadly is no longer going to be an option in future VRDs, at least at St. Lotus. But. Yeah, uh, that, that one was more... For the memes, like, <laughs> it, it was fun, and the one time I actually did it, it was set all the wreckage away from working. <laughs> right, yeah, fair. But um, it was one of the, 
I got in a situation where I forced them to have the answer. Mm -hmm. They have the answer. I lose. They don't. They lose. Right. No, that's fair. (laughs) But uh, Are, are there other standouts of like this is a like a clear deck that wouldn't be good enough for a main deck that should be sideboarded into? I think that a lot of the decks that are going to be easiest to build the transformative board for are probably going to be like some of the two card Monty decks. Okay. Because you could very much have one, one essentially one pile for your main, and a, a complete morph into a completely different de- combo based deck. So like, say you've got an artifact co- based combo, so they're going to bring in all their artifact hate. Right. You board into a different non artifact based combo, and all their sideboard cards are now just dead. Gotcha. This is kind of like the Doomsday Cephalid Breakfast kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sure. So, like, I, I think it's an underutilized strategy in this format, but at the same time, I'm not claiming to be an expert either. I'm just basing on my observations of I've done it twice sure. to varying degrees of success. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, no, I feel like nobody has played this format enough, with the possible exception of Mason, to really have strong feelings about anything. So, <laughs> anyone that does, I think, is, is probably like not played enough to really feel like their opinions are, are weak. And, and I'm, I'm sure he, he probably thinks I'm nuts for advocating for transformative decks. But Mason thinks everybody is nuts, and that's the joy of Mason. That's why we like him. <laughs> yeah. but, this is true. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, it's been great. It's, thanks for talking through this whole thing. Um, I feel like. I feel like your deck got robbed. It's going to be straight up. Uh, I don't know exactly where it should have fallen, but like one and seven is not 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 good enough for the cards that you drafted. Right. So. Although I will say the one card that I think actually vastly overperformed on the day, yeah, was Felden Ronom Excavator. Really? Mm-hmm. Say more about that. What did Felden do that was so good? Um, a lot of times you swing him in, like he just gets in free damage because they don't want to give you the card advantage. Oh, okay. Because. Do you think people should be should be just like trading off with them earlier? Yes. Okay. Because we're the later you let it go on, a the more damage he's punched through, mm-hmm. and b the more likely it is you're having to throw something bigger in front of him and giving me more options. Sure. No, that's fair. Uh, for, for decks that play creatures, that seems like mm-hmm. it could be really useful. I wouldn't mm-hmm. know about that though. So. <laughs> You should try it sometime. I don't. I don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, it seems like a lot of complicated math, and I can't handle that. Math is for blockers. Yeah, basically. <laughs> cool. Well, it's been great. Thanks. Mm-hmm. For, thanks for hanging out. And yeah, excited for the next one on April first. We're gonna see if anyone does pull out the mountains. So, thanks everyone for watching. And yeah, we'll see you in a few few weeks now. God, two weeks. Mm-hmm.